What's up, everybody? Welcome to the latest edition of the Stephen A. Smith Show, coming at you at the very least every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday over the digital airwaves of YouTube. Thank you for joining me, and once again, thank you for continuing to watch this show. The, the subscriber base continues to grow, continues to proliferate. We're now over 568,000 subscribers and counting. Can't thank y'all for the love enough. Rapidly pro approaching 570,000 subscribers within the calendar year, so... Doesn't happen without y'all love and support. Really, really appreciate it. Hope you've enjoyed the commentary. Hope you've enjoyed the interviews and what have you. And if you continue to do so, feel free. And you want to continue to do so, feel free. Just click the bell for the Stephen A. Smith Show and bam, you'll be a latest subscriber. Also, while you're at it, don't forget to pick up a copy of my new book. Uh, shouldn't say new anymore. It's a New York Times bestseller. It's labeled Straight Shooter, a memoir of second chances and first takes. It is now out in paperback. You can go to straightshooterbook.com to order the book. That's straightshooterbook.com to order the book. So thank you again for your support. The other day, as in Wednesday, I had the pleasure of taping an interview with Charles Barkley. He was en route to doing his show, King Charles, on CNN every week show that he does weekly with the one and only Gail King, um, where he engages in political and social commentary. I must say I'm kind of jealous. I love that. I love that outlet that he has available to him and I'm happy for him. Uh, but while he was here, I took time to have a very, very lengthy interview about him spanning all things sports, particularly the NBA and then venturing and segueing into politics, social issues, and just life overall in and of itself. So on Wednesday, you, sure, you saw a small part of that interview, approximately 10 or 11 minutes or so. We spoke for nearly an hour. That means there was a lot more to show you. And I saved it for you for today. Here is yours truly with the one and only Sir Charles Barkley. Okay, everybody, you know what time it is. It's time for Stephen A's Weekly Picks. I've teamed up with Prize Picks to bring you my favorite sports picks each and every single week. Not sure if y'all know this, but Prize Picks is a skill-based, real-money daily fantasy sports game where you select two or more players and predict if they'll have more or less of their in-game stats. But the part that I really love, you can pick and choose from all the sports that you watch. Basketball, soccer, hockey, even darts. And if you go to prizepicks.com right now and use promo code SAS, you'll receive a 100% deposit bonus up to $100. That's right. You heard me. Go to prizepicks.com, type in my initials SAS, and get a first-time deposit match up to $100. Today, however, I will not be selecting any sports. I'll be taking a suggestion from one of our fans who watches the show. Today's prize pick selection comes from... At Halo's Dub, who is asking, Stephen A., should you have more or less than eight hours of sleep a night? Because everyone needs their sleep, y'all. My theory is very, very simple. You could say eight hours. You could say seven hours. I'd say at least six hours. You got to have six hours. Anything less than six is debilitating. And here's something else that I've learned over the last few months as I was losing some weight, gaining some muscle, getting myself in shape, getting rid of all that nasty body fat on my body. What I learned is this. Did you realize that no matter how much lifting you do, no matter how much exercising you do, that actually muscle is built most while you sleep? It's the sleep. It's the rest that your body is getting. An opportunity to churn a little bit and reactivate itself and get itself going. Building muscle. Shredding fat. That happens at its best. At its most effectiveness. When you're asleep. So that's another incentive. Outside of rest. Outside of mental acuity. Outside of being able to get up and feel vibrant and alive and ready to go in the morning because you know you got your rest touching on that REM sleep at night. The other, the other, ad, the other additive to it, the other bonus to it is the fact that muscle building, you best contribute to it when you give your body its proper rest. Seven to eight hours is ideal. Don't get me wrong. If you can get it, get it. If you got to go to sleep earlier so you can wake up a half hour earlier, whatever the case may be, that's what you do. But at the very least, prioritize a minimum of six hours sleep. When you get six hours sleep, at the very least, you're in pretty good shape. You're resting your body. You're healing your body. 
You're emboldening yourself to be able to tackle things you never thought you'd be able to tackle because your body has received the proper rest. That's your boy Stephen A. talking to you. That's my answer to your question. Okay? Six hours or more. Anything less is uncivilized. Charles Barkley, welcome back aboard. Um, just the other day, we had a conversation, and we were getting into an abundance of things about these NBA players, about NBA All-Star Weekend. Don't even get me started on the slam dunk contest, which I don't even think that players should, NBA players should even be a part of anymore. I'm just so disgusted with the lack of effort that they put forth in the stars that don't participate or whatever. I'm wondering, Barkley, as we sit here right now, how are you feeling about the state of the NBA game? You're on TV twice a week throughout the season and especially come playoff time and beyond talking about this product. I talk about the product every day. How are you feeling about the NBA product compared to what it once was? Well, I think you have to be concerned uh, as everybody has to be concerned because the one thing you can't do is alienate your fans. That's the one thing you can't do because the fans make everything go. You know, they buy our products. They watch our sport. And once you piss them off, Stephen A., there's going to be some repercussions. You know, fans going to say, wait a minute. This guy's making $50 million a year, and he going to rest on some nights. He don't want to play basketball. Like I say, the most games you're going to play in a week is four. I think most people – like I say, yeah, I'm pretty, like I say, I'm pretty sure everybody don't want to go to work all the time. Right. But if you're going to make $50, $60 million a year and just say, hey, you know what? I'm only going to play two out of three, three out of four. At some point, the fan going to be saying, wait a minute, you're charging me this much for tickets. Why in the world should I care if they don't care? And I think we're what's going to be interesting with this new TV deal when guys start making even more money. And then, like, you have a guy making 75, 80, 90, God, God forbid, $100 million a year to play basketball. Right. And the guy says, you know, I'm on rest tonight. At some point, the fans going to be saying, hey, you know what? Yeah, I've had enough. If this dude don't care about me. And that's the one thing that concerns me going forward. Man, we're the luckiest dudes in the world to play basketball. We're the luckiest dudes in the world. If you look at sports landscape. You look at sports landscape. Nobody get paid better than basketball players. Nobody. Some people would try to bring up baseball, but they're not taking into account the minor well, league first, system no, and how no, you got to go through that baseball, before you ever get to the oh, main. No, first of all, that's total bill shit. Number one, they play 162 games a year. They play 162 yep. games a year. They play every day. And also, if you look at it, go look at it. How many players are they actually paying? They ain't paying but yeah. three or four players. Everybody on the M the average NBA salary is ten million dollars. But we got on every I'm pretty sure on every team, we got five to seven players making twenty to twenty five million dollars a year. I, I, if you look at the the, the the let's take the Yankees, they're probably paying five guys big money. They're playing mm -hmm. five guys big money, but they're not paying those guys, other guys and also right. A lot of those guys got to be in the minor leagues for a long time to pick it back on your point. We are by far and away the best paid and work the least amount. Those guys play 162 games a year. We play 82. These guys don't even want to play 82. We get four months vacation to do absolutely nothing. So we are by far and away the best compensated jocks in the entire world. Well, I... I'll ask you this question, and it's a bit dicey, but hell, it's you, and you're talking to me, so you know neither one of us are scared to tackle these kind of issues. I pay attention to two things as well, and I'm going to be unapologetic about it. Number one, it's one thing to sit out. It's another thing to be at the game, on the bench, with fly-ass street clothes. <laughs> it's essentially flaunt, you know, you know, flaunting it, you know what I'm saying? while you're not playing, but we know you're going to play tomorrow night or two nights later or whatever, but for some reason you can't play tonight. I think that's a slap in the face to fans. And then the other thing that I have to sit up there and say and ask this question to you is that we know the plight of the African-American athlete from the past. We know what 
folks had to deal with, had to endure in order to position these players to get to this point. It could be in some of these players' eyes, it's a way of snubbing their nose at the system, a way of them saying the hell with it. We never had control before, but we've got more control, more play empowerment than ever before, and we're going to utilize it to our advantage rather than just make these folks money. We're going to position ourselves to milk as much money as we possibly can out of it. What do you say to that level of thinking on behalf of players? Well, I think a couple of things. I've already, I don't believe in load management uh, because, dude, everybody's hurt. Uh, everybody's got some, t- yeah, my knee's sore. Like, okay, like I said, if, I'm pretty sure if you're a nurse, your knee is sore. Pretty sure if you're a teacher, your knee is sore. But you still have to go to work, and you're definitely not compensated like jocks are. As far as the black perspective, you have to understand who you didn't you somebody did a lot of heavy lifting to put you in this situation. You're not making all this money because you're great at sports. Yeah, there's a couple of them are great at sports, but most of them just born at the right time. So instead of appreciating making things uh, better around them, no, you don't ever stub your nose. You said, you know what, man, I'm a lucky dude. I'm going to take advantage of this situation. You should give, I always believe you should give a certain amount, amount of money to, 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 to other people who are less fortunate. I really think that's a big deal because you can give a small amount that means a really big deal to the rest of your, especially in your community. So to, 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 you have a really good point. But as a black man, I think it's really important for me to give back to the black community. I think it's really important. And the one thing I don't want to do, I want allies. I don't want to alienate anybody. That's one of the things mm-hmm. I use in my speeches all the time. I want allies. I'm not trying to alienate anybody. Anybody want to help? Because I look at it different from a perspective. It's not just black. It's poor white. You know, everybody in America wants to talk about race. And race racism exists, always has, and unfortunately always will. But economic racism is the, one of the biggest problems you have in this world. Man, if you're born poor in this country, whether you're black or white, Hispanic or whatever, you're going to be, I used the baseball analogy, you're going to be born with two strikes against you. You're going to probably go up in a bad neighborhood. You're probably going to go to an inferior school. And let me tell you something. Yeah, there's going to be a couple of the brothers get hits on O2, but most of the people, if you put Barry Bonds, who's the best baseball player I've ever seen, you put him up there. You put Aaron Judge. You put all those guys up at the plate, and it's over for 2. We, it's not going to be a lot of people getting hits. So I think it's really important when you make a lot of money, especially if you're black, to make sure you reach back in your community and try to bring as many people to you as in, in, in possible. But to piggyback as far as rubbing people the wrong way, I'm really against that because, man, I want anybody who want to help us get better uh, anybody who want to help black people or poor white people get better, I'm all in for the help because we need more help because, mm-hmm. because number one, we can never catch up, but we can make things better. But I'll tell you this much, though. It's kind of funny hearing you say you never want to rub people the wrong way because other than you being absolutely hysterical, arguably the funniest man on television for crying out loud, you are also known for being incredibly candid. And and that clearly has rubbed people the wrong way, especially some of these these players from this generation. I mean, what do you say to that when people look at you and they look at your candor and they look at the fact that you're so honest and you're so forthcoming and straightforward and they have an issue with that? How do you deal with that, knowing that you want to be pe- bring people together? You don't want to be divisive in any way, but you certainly are not going to be dishonest. That's not who you are. Yeah, I'm going to do my job. I'm gonna do my job. I ain't worried about what these fools think of me. Uh, I'm gonna. I've never. I've never. I can say this. I've never gotten on TV and said anything personal about a guy. If I'm asked a question, I'm going to be honest. Uh, man, this generation, man, they are so sensitive. Like Dr. J taught me something because at one point when I was becoming a star, a couple guys wrote things about me. Dr. J said something to me very interesting. He says, "Chuck, stop for a second. He says before you just overreact and." Because, you know, normally when people say stuff, your normal reaction is to go back at them. He said, do me a favor. When people start writing bad stuff about you or saying stuff about you, the first question you have to ask yourself is, is it a fair criticism? I said, what? He says, hey, we all got criticized. I got criticized. I'm Dr. J. He says, 
the first question you have to ask yourself, is it a fair criticism? And it, that taught me a lot. And I can go back and look at my entire career. I've never criticized a guy. That don't mean I'm always right, but it's never been personal. Never been personal. I've never taken a personal shot at a guy, but I'm going to always do my job. And I feel very good. Listen, I didn't get to where I am right now with hot takes. I got here being very good at my job, not to pat myself on yep. the back, but it's for true. some reason, and listen, you started your question with the most important thing to me, being honest. Hey man, I'm going to be honest. I don't sit there and say, well, let me, well, let me worry about what he is going to say here. No, 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 no. I'm talking to the people at home. I'm not worried about what the jock and his damn mama, daddy, and his, his agent and friends have to say. I'm going to do my job, period. Have you been concerned or was there ever a time where you were hurt because you felt like somebody took personal shots at you because you were just doing your job as a commentator? Sure, that's been a couple of times because they, they made it personal. They didn't say they... LeBron James was one of them. Yeah, but they, and, and, and like I say... I, I And I was like, yo, I'm not going to come back at you. What I said with you was just about you as a basketball player. It had nothing to do with you as a person. And he took some personal shots at me, which is, that's fine, because I have did some stupid shit in my life. That's part of your resume. Everything goes on your resume, Stephen A. Right. You know, so, yeah, that. but I just laughed about it. I'm like, yo, you can take personal shots at me. Yeah, I did some stupid things in my life. That don't mean what I said about him wasn't true. And I've said this about LeBron. I think that LeBron is the greatest. Now, I think Michael Jordan a greater player, but I think LeBron's story is arguably the greatest, greatest story. story in sports. Because out of all the guys in high school come to the who came to the NBA, he was actually the only one who was ready. As great as Kobe Bryant was, he struggled early. He wasn't ready. Kevin Garnett struggles. McGrady struggles. I think those three are the best high school players who went direct to the NBA. But let's look at it from a con. LeBron was the only one who was ready from day one. And for him to be where he started at 18, we broadcast that first game that night, yep. to where he is Against today, Sacramento. I think it's the greatest sports story in history. He's been a great player. And, you know, he's been a model citizen. I think he's a wonderful person. I don't know him really, really well, but the times I've been around him, he's gave me great respect. I have great respect for him. And I do. I think it's probably the greatest sports story ever for a guy to come in with that much scrutiny to live in today, 24 hour where people are always out trying to get you. I think it's one of the greatest sports stories ever. Uh, but when he took a shot at me, I kind of just laughed. But because like I say, I do, man, I'm going to do my job. I've never like... Because the fans aren't stupid. Well, some of them are. Uh, <laughs> you know, some of them are stupid. Because fans are stupid to a certain degree. Not most of them, but some of them, they're like, you better say great stuff about my favorite team and my favorite player. And if you deviate from that, they get mad. What's really interesting, you know, we only travel for the conference finals. And one city hates me and one city loves me. Because mm -hmm. we have to pick a city. We have to pick a team. Stephen A., let me just tell you this, man. I don't give a rat's ass who win in the playoffs. You know what I want? I want it to be over so I can get to vacation. The note, when Ernie said, but you and I are different. You and I are different. I don't care about the outcome. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's as why long as the Knicks ass. are not in it, that's I don't care about who wins sometimes. or loses. But I do care about the location. No, that's exactly right. That's why I hate your ass sometimes. Because <laughs> you you can you always pull it for the warm weather team. Because you want to walk around right. and looking good and everything. Right. Man. First of all, we all... Listen, I don't get to be on a golf course like you for four months. I'm working during those four months you on a golf course. You realize that, you right? You got a good point there. You, you, <laughs> yeah, you got a great point there. But like I say, I don't... Man, I really don't care. Ernie says, who you think going to win a series? They they kill me in one city. They love me in the other city. I'm like, yo, man, hope y'all really don't... Well, we all know. We 
Chuck, stop, 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 stop it. You all, we all know which city hates you lo- most, right? Them damn San Antonio. <laughs> yeah, San Antonio. Wait, I, mean, hey. I mean, my God. I think you're going to give Shaq a heart attack one day on the show. Every time you bring up those big women in San Antonio, <laughs> man, I, you go, Shaq is going to die. He is going to die. He might be the first person on the history of television that's going to die from a heart attack from laughing so hey. damn hard because of the way you get on those San Antonio women. You know, what's so, you know that, you right? Know what, it's even, you know what's so funny about it? You know, you say stuff on TV, you try, cause you know, our job, you know, I don't think people understand, man, we're on from seven o'clock to two in the morning and yeah. at midnight when you got a crappy game, it seems even longer yeah. and you're like, yo man, we got to have some fun. We got to do something. Cause people ain't going to watch this game. We've been in, we've been on since seven o'clock. It's one o'clock in the morning. And people like, man, those were one good game, one bad game. And then we was like, man, let's make people have a good time because we want people to mm-hmm. watch. And, you know, San Antonio, I was just having fun. And then when I went down there and they were like coming for me, uh, these women were coming up to me. I ain't that big. I mean, and, and we're <laughs> laughing. And, and, uh, and then I got people coming up. Chuck, you right. We got some biggers down here. And I'm laughing both ways, Stephen A., I mean, it was hilarious. I mean, I was because man, you want people to have fun watching stupid basketball. That's all it is. We ain't got no problems, man. We get paid. We these players got the greatest lives. We got great lives. But you want the fans? We're trying to relate to the fans. I ain't worried about these sensitive ass NBA players. I'm trying to make sure people enjoy watching basketball. But if I'm asked a basketball question. You can be 100% correct that I'm going to give you what I think is my truth. Let me tell you something right now. I don't know if you know this or not, but I was down there the first time when you started talking about them women. I was going to San Antonio well, playoff game. I think it was the finals. And we, they were going against Detroit because you started talking about it as recently, you know, back in 2004, 2005 when they were going against the Pistons. Man, they were protesting. They had they <laughs> they had protest signs <laughs> block to block going into the arena <laughs> trying to ban you <laughs> from the city. I mean, it was hysterical, man. I swear to God, I was laughing so damn hard. I said, this is some funny stuff right here. And Shaq didn't make it no better because he just, he's, I mean, literally, he looked like he was going to choke. Hey, man, you, listen, as long as people are paying attention to you, that's all you want when you're on television. I mean, you want you mm. want people. You hope first of all, you hope they have a good sense of humor. But like I say, I had so many people walk up to me having fun with it. The mayor was making fun of me one time, and I was like, I was laughing. You get the mayor. The mayor made a video because you know because <laughs> I said I said, wait a minute. First of all, they called the river walk. It's a dirty little creek, okay. <laughs> and then like they called the river walk. I said it's a creek. I'm from the south. It's a creek. It is and then their number one tourist attraction, Stephen A., is a place where everybody got killed. Think about that. The Alamo. The Alamo. They are like, yeah. wait a minute. Y'all, number one tourist <laughs> place is a place where everybody got killed. And they want, what, what, huh. what can I do with this? Y'all got a dirty little creek y'all call a river. And they're like, well, you want to take a tour of the Alamo? I'm like, yeah. And I was like, Oh, I remember that from school. This is where everybody got killed. So it's killed. the creek, it's the Alamo, and it's the women. Uh, uh, it's, that's it. Big women and the Alamo where everybody got killed. Come on. What can I do with that, Stephen A.? <laughs> what, can, what can I Listen, do with that? Me, Big me, old women and the number one tourist place where everybody got killed. Churros. Yeah, churros. Don't let Shaq see this. Don't let Shaq see this. Let's, let's talk about the churros. Don't let him hear talk about the churros. He's going to lose his mind. I'm trying to tell you that right now. <laughs> No, listen, man, how, how are you going from doing that and having fun talking about basketball to doing King Charles, your show on CNN with you and Gail King? By the way, it airs tonight, this Wednesday night. Definitely, you're going to make forward, look forward to that. I, I got to admit to you, I was kind of surprised because I know how passionate you are about certain issues, and I get that. But I watched you yeah. on with Gail King a few times. You look more and more polished and more and more comfortable talking about serious issues and politics and all that stuff, more so than I've ever seen you before. Talk about that for a second, because that is definitely a change for you to some degree, in my opinion. Well, it's definitely a change. You know, Stephen, when you're a jock, 
you know, obviously things have changed, but these guys have all these social media platforms. They can send what they want to. And now you guys are asking them way more stuff about life, which I think is really cool and important. But they're not just shut up and dribble. They're really important. Uh, they got, they, they got vast amount of wealth that they can really do some things, you know, and I, I, I didn't want to work more to be honest with you. But the, uh, Gail and Gail didn't want to work more, but we want to work together because because mm. I got a lot of love and respect for Gail. Yeah, she's a friend. I've but, known her. Yeah, for years. but you know, man, there's some interesting times we're in. Uh, a political climate. This uh, political climate we're in, where you know people are trying to block the vet, the the black vote in certain states. Uh, I think we really need to pay attention to that. Uh, you know, people have been really harsh. Uh, you know, I'm a big proponent of gay, transgender people. That there's mm -hmm. a lot of hate and discrimination going on against gay and transgender people. Because I mm -hmm. want to make sure I stand up for those people. Because, you know, there are very few people who are going to have enough power uh, to, to stand up for those type of people. And I always want to make sure I stand up against any form of discrimination. And I feel very good, very confident. Like I say, I don't think I'm always right, but if I see any hatred, you know, we got a lot of anti-Semitism going on right, right. now. I'm standing up for those people because I want them to stand up for me. That goes back to my original thing. Like, hey, man, I want allies. I'm not trying to alienate anybody. I don't want to be on an island by myself. Anybody want to help black people? I want your help. I want your support. You know, because the, the wealth gap in this country has exploded. You know, things have, we got this presidential election coming up. That's a really, really big. That's where I was going. It's a really, really big deal. We got two candidates. Uh, I'm not happy with either candidate. Uh, Neither am I. I. I think that, you know, uh, Mr. Biden's had a great, great life and career. I just think he's too old to be the president. And uh, and and uh, President Trump, man, I I don't want our president acting like that. You know, whether I disagree with your policies or whatever, there's a certain dignity that goes with being president of the United States. I can disagree. No question. Yeah, I consider myself an independent. Uh, I voted Democratic. So do I. Yeah, I vote Democratic most of the time. And so do I. Yeah, but I think that we got to start doing a better job, uh, Stephen A. Because I have voted Democratic my entire life, but I think they've been doing a disservice to black people. That don't mean I want them to go out there and vote Republican now. Let's get that shit out the right. way. But every black person I've known my entire life has always voted Democratic. And I said to myself, well, damn, other than me dunking a basketball, everybody else in the exact same boat. And I think we got to do a much better job if we vote Democratic to hold them accountable and do more instead of showing up in our neighborhoods every four years and say, vote for us. And that's what they've actually been doing for the last, as long as I've been alive. Because, you know, these neighborhoods are the same. These schools are the same. The economic opportunities are the same. And like I say, I just don't like the way President, I, don't, I just don't like the way President Trump carries himself. And like I say, people can vote for him. I don't tell anybody to vote for him, but I'm going to have my opinion. You know, I'm really excited to have Nikki Haley on tonight because I went at her pretty hard about a month ago because she said she didn't believe racism existed in America. Which was utterly ridiculous. I, I went at her hard. Well, too. and I said, well, she, she, I think she's right. If you discredit slavery, Jim Crow, segregation, I said, it's been peachy king for us black folks if you take those three things Civil out of War. it. And I was just, and I'm gonna tell her this tonight. I said, I, 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 I said, tell her this Wednesday night. Yeah, go tonight, ahead. tonight I'm gonna tell her. Yeah, I'm gonna say, listen, I'm not mad at you. I'm disappointed because mm -hmm. I'm looking for somebody to vote for. Because my vote means something to me. It might not mean a damn thing to anybody else out there, but it means a lot to me because I look at all those black people who've been beat with, with uh, sticks, night sticks, dog sicked on them, spray holes. Mm -hmm. They're they out there marching for me to have the right to vote. So my vote means something to me. 
I don't give a damn what everybody else thinks. So my vote means something to me. So I've been looking for somebody to vote for. Let me share uh, a few opinions with you and let me get your reaction to them. I'm just going to give it up to you in one lump sum. I am a fiscal conservative and a social liberal, which makes me an independent. I'm all for liberalism on the social side. I'm about gay rights, transgender rights, et cetera, et cetera, uh, pro-choice. I don't believe I have a right to tell a woman what to do with her body. Um, but in the same breath, when we look at a lot of policies that come raking through Capitol Hill or sifting through Capitol Hill, one of the things that obviously plays a role in every single decision that is made they ask you how you're going to pay for it, like Planned Parenthood. Okay, pro-choice. You can be pro-choice, but do you think somebody has the right to say that, you know what, if I wanted an abortion, that federal funding should subsidize that? So you think about things like that. That's one mm -hmm. thing. I think about certain Republican candidates. Would I vote for Nikki Haley? I'd, I'd strongly consider it compared to what we have out there. I'd strongly think about it. I was a fan of John Kasich. When he ran in 2016. Hey, Stephen A., um, Stephen I A., know, John yeah. Kasich is the only Republican I've ever voted for for president. Wow. You voted for I him? I did. Wow. He's the, only Republican. Never, the only, He's the only Republican I've ever voted for for president. The only Republican I've ever voted for, period, was Chris Christie. And that was a governor in New Jersey because I couldn't stand Corzine at the time because I thought he was an absolute mess. But I thought about Christie. I, 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 you look at Kasich. Um, definitely him. Marco Rubio is somebody I would have considered. Jeb Bush is somebody I would have considered. And I bring those nuggets up, Charles, to get to this point in terms of what you said about the Democratic Party. I despise when folks look at Republicans and automatically throw out the word race because that implies that on the Democratic side, none of them are. And last time I checked throughout history, there have been Democrats who were associated with the Ku Klux Klan and other things that were any that were widely considered racist and they were a part of the Democratic Party. So when we get caught up in that and we don't know our history enough or at least well enough to know what role the Democrats have played in the past, it gets me a bit concerned because that to me is why black folks are struggling because we're very adamant and open and transparent against the Republican Party. As a result, it gives the Democrats a license to take us for granted, and then that's how we become disenfranchised because we don't really have anybody representing our interests. Well, that's where I'm coming from with it. How do you feel about that? Well, first of all, you, you hit on some, some serious PowerPoints there. Number one, I'm pro-choice. Uh, I'm really pro-choice. I don't think we should tell women how to do what to do with their body. Uh, right. Listen, I think the one thing we have to realize both of these parties are full of shit, Stephen A. That's the first thing we have to. It's an individual. Like, there's some people in both parties that are great, but both parties, that are great both parties in general, full they don't, they're full of it. They don't care about the American people. They just care about their district and the things like that. Listen, uh, I'm pro-choice. I, I actually wanted to vote for Christie. I really did. I've always liked Chris Christie. Uh, I 100% agree with you. And he just, obviously, he's, he's out of the thing right now. I, listen, I still yeah, might vote for him. Because <laughs> I, I when I vote, I, I have I, I write in. Because uh, like I say, I'm not going to vote for somebody just because they're a Democrat or a Republican. But if, if I tell my black friends, man, if you're going to vote Democratic, that's fine. I, I've always voted Democratic. But why do we let them off the hook? They only come around every four years. That they, they never put programs in place to help us to be more successful. I mean... They put it in place to help us be more dependent on yes. them. Yes. I was like, wait a minute. Uh, wait a minute. Y'all just came up with $95 million for Ukraine. Uh, like... Billion. Billion. Not, billion. $95 billion. I said, wait a minute. And I, I'm, I'm saying to myself, I'm not pretty sure you don't have that over there in the petty cash drawer. If you got... That's, you came up with $95 billion dollars and what about the trillions they printed out when COVID was going on? And, but like, wait, could we have been using that money to improve the public school system and things like that? Homelessness. Yes, home, I mean, because homelessness, well, just a minute, and this thing, this crime wave we got going around the country where people just running in stores, this is crazy, man. This is crazy. People just running in stores, robbing people, all this homeless stuff. It's, it's, it's just to the point, yo, man. We elected y'all to do y'all job. 
Y'all do your job. Stop this homelessness stuff. Get these people off the street. Find some other way to leave them in front of just out and taking advantage of the public. And hey, if you come in these stores robbing people, number one, it's open season on your ass. But also, if we catch you, you're going to jail. Yeah. You know, I've been coming up here to New York to do this show for like the last uh, couple months. And like yes. two. And you see the streets. You see the streets in New two, York. Three weeks ago on TV, they had these 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 uh, migrants. First of all, the border is a joke. The border is a joke. Yeah. But they had these migrants, they call them, had just bust up in New York. They got them on camera kicking and beating like cops. They beat up these two cops. Guys. Beating up two cops, but, beating up two police officers but they were, in the subway Steve station. Nate, they were out of jail in 24 hours, and the next day... Actually, actually, it was the same day, Charles. But, uh, yeah, the same but, day. The, but two days later, they called them, called them Rob and Macy's. I'm like, wow. first of all, they beat up cops. How are you out of jail in 24 hours? And then clearly, two days later, they're robbing Macy's. Anybody, whether you're a Democrat, Republican, or dog, or cat, or puppy, you know that's wrong. Period. But it's woke culture. But with woke culture and everything else that's been going on, you've got folks on the left that have have endorsed a more lenient legal system, and obviously folks on the right going crazy about it and calling for law and order. Who do you side with considering our iniquitous history, what's going on today, and who the candidates are in terms of Biden and Trump in all likelihood running for office? What do you do, Charles? Who do you vote for? Oh, oh first of all, we need law and order, Stephen A. If we're gonna, I agree. We're gonna. I'm with yeah, you, dude. We need law and order. Hey, trying to fix inequalities has nothing to do with letting people go in stores and rob people. That has nothing to do. That has nothing to do with diversity or handling inequalities. Letting random people just run in all these stores, stealing stuff, and you know because innocent people. They should always be protected. But did we need law and order. Yeah. Do we need to address diversity and inequalities? 100%. But to go out here and say, oh, like this, that's my personal favorite. Unless you steal $1,000, we're not going to press charges. Well, Stephen A., I want that same damn deal. I want to be able to. How about, how about the $53 million in prepaid credit cards uh, for migrants? Uh, that's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. Uh, I mean, come on, man. And um, yeah. Black folks been in the streets. Latinos been in the streets homeless. Minorities have been in the streets homeless, starving for years. We ain't never got, yeah. ain't never got anything like that. Like, I grew up on hey, welfare. Hey, what are they talking hey, about? Hey, I'm like, we ain't I'm never had nothing like that. They didn't, uh, like, they just, wait, we're we going to find $53 million. I'm like, damn, we can do a lot with $53 million. I mean, but, man, that's why I say this whole thing is broken. And we need some adults to come and say, hey, listen, I understand some things, but yeah, we're not going to let, we just are not going to let everybody run wild and do what the hell they want to do. I mean, because that's just not right. I mean, it's just not right and it's just not fair. So if that's the case, Charles, I go back to my original question directly. Biden or Trump? Neither. I'm not voting for either one of them. Wow. I, first of all, okay. I, I told you, I, listen. Mr. Biden, President Biden had a great life, and I think he's a great man. He's just too old to be president. And right. under no circumstances, zero, would I vote for Trump. Under no circumstances. Like right now, I'm going to write in somebody. I'm looking forward to interviewing Nikki Haley. Because, mm -hmm. you know, the first thing I'm going to tell her, Stephen A., I'm disappointed in you, what you said. And you want to know yeah. why? Because you felt the need to say that to that group of people. So, so mm. she was catering to that group. That's what they all do. I know that. But for her to say there's never been racism in America. Utterly and ridiculous. First of all, as a minority and a woman. As a minority and a woman for her to say that. But what hurt me and disappointed me the most was she felt like that's what that group wanted to hear. That's what bothered me, Stephen A. Stephen A., listen, I've known you for a long time, and you damn sure know Chuck. I ain't never. I told you. There's two things that ain't going to happen. If y'all catch my big black ass in bed naked with a gun in my head, hand, and I, they say I committed suicide, call Perry Mason, Barnaby Jones, or somebody. <laughs> that didn't happen. 
Right. Hey, that's the first thing. I ain't never going to kill myself. Secondly, I ain't never going to go in no room saying, I'm going to tell y'all what y'all want to hear. That ain't never going to happen. Dude, I made right. my name and reputation on being honest. Am I always right? 100% not. But I ain't never got on television, your show, any place in the world says, I'm going to tell y'all what y'all want to hear. Y'all ask me a right. question. I'm going to be honest. I'm going to try to be fair. And I'm going to tell my truth. It's my truth. It ain't mm. nobody else's truth. But I ain't never going to do those two things I just said. It. You? You still want to run for office? No, man, because I realize that both of these parties are full of it, Stephen A. Stephen A., listen, when you watch politics every day, they disagree on every subject. Yep. That's impossible. 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 And it's also impossible that they all side, every all of them that are Republicans and all of them are Democrats, side with each other on every single issue as well. That's impossible. It's also impossible. I, I told somebody one time, Man, I could go in the room with a dude from the Ku Klux Klan, and we would not disagree on every subject. Now, when we disagree on race, 100%. But there's no way. Uh, like, it, it, I always use the Ku Klux Klan analogy, but I'm pretty sure if I went in the room with any single person in the world, would we disagree on every subject? That's That's impossible. Impossible. Question for you. Are you ready for this one? If I was running, would you vote for me? Yeah, you, you, you know what? Yes, because Stephen A. The one. Oh, Lord, I was only joking. No, no. <laughs> let me let me tell you why. Lord. Let me tell you why. Because I know you don't have an evil bone in your body. And I don't think Appreciate you have an agenda. See, that's all I want. I can disagree. Yeah. Fact, even if you vote for somebody, you're not going to agree on every subject. Come on. Yeah, if I whoever I vote for, some of these politicians, you know, they're still, you know, they're talking about abortion. I said, hey, abortion is a non starter for me. I'll vote for you, but I want you to know I'm pro choice, period. Right. You can't talk me off the ledge. I'm pro choice. Or it could be another subject, uh, you know, and I said, okay, I'm still going to vote for you. We just disagree on a couple subjects. As long as you don't have a hidden agenda, you can have my malice intent. Malice, malice, malice intent, or just we just disagree. It, right. I can disagree with somebody. One of my favorite phrases, I use it all the time when I'm talking to my homeboys, bruh, we agree to disagree. And I ain't mad at you, and you ain't mad at me. We just disagree. I'm good with that. Mm -hmm. You have an opportunity, Charles Barkley, with King Charles and Gail King. Your influence continues to grow. Let's hypothetically speak this into the existence. It gets to a point where you have the potential to swing an election. Who do you get to convince to run for the Democratic nomination and ultimately the presidency? Gavin Newsom, the governor of California, or the former First Lady Michelle Obama? Well, I probably would go with Gavin Newsom for the simple fact he's been in politics, ran a big state before. First of all, that, that to me would be a perfect ticket. That would be a perfect ticket. I'm a big Gavin Newsom fan. You know, I think obviously a huge advantage that he's ran a state as big as California. Yeah. Uh, a lot of homelessness and crime and immigration issues, though. It's, but it, to be fair, but hey, all the states got the same issue, man. Uh, uh, all, listen, it, the, the, the uh, yeah, lot, yeah, every I mean. state got issues. But the only reason I would give him an advantage is because he's actually. Hey, man, everybody said they want a job, Stephen A., until they get the job. <laughs> hey, everybody says they want the job until they get the job. Because you don't know. There's very few jobs that people can be like, okay, I want that job. Yeah, you think you want that job, but you don't know what all that job entails. And like I say, I will, hey, listen, listen, if, if Gavin Newsom and Michelle Obama ran I'll tell you right now, they got my vote. They got my, I don't care. I don't care who's leading the ticket, to be honest with you. She, uh, I don't care who's leading the ticket. Uh, uh, I'm a big Gavin Newsom fan. Uh, but man, right now, I, I'm the greatest country in the world. This is what we got going on right now. I, I, I am shambles. really, I, I listen, I'm not going to lie. I'm really concerned what the next year holds. I really am. The next year, 
Um, and if people, I, I got to tell, I'll put it to you this way, Charles. I'm scared shitless for, yeah. for two reasons. Number one, on the side of Biden, it's not that you old, it's that you look it. You clearly have lost a step. You're not what you used to be, and we can see it as clear as day. On the part of Trump, I look at him and I say, civil war is imminent if this dude is the president, because I think he's going to be on a revenge tour. I think he's going to be insensitive to leading all of America. And as a result, he's going to be as divisive as ever and as vindictive as ever. And we're not going to be having somebody that's actually running the country. I'm scared to death more so than I have ever been in my adult life because I don't want either of them to be the president of the United States. But I don't know if Gavin Newsom can beat Trump. I think Michelle Obama could beat Trump. I don't think Gavin Newsom can. And in the case of Nikki Haley, I don't think she's going to be able to beat Trump either. And that is where my fear lies. Well, I think, I actually, it's so funny you said that because we haven't even talked about this before. I think if Trump is reelected, he's going to spend the next four years paying back people. And, man, people don't want payback. You know, it's interesting. I mean, I watch a lot of television. Cause I, I think it's really important and significant. I know what's going on in the world, not just my world. You know, I look at those yep. poor, I look at those poor people in Hawaii. You know, I, you know, we got to help Hawaii rebuild. We really got to solve this border problem. I mean, that's what people care about. People don't care about sexual assaults, what happened and things. I know it's important. We don't want to talk about that. We don't want to talk about Hunter Biden. Man, people won't like, yo, man, how can we solve this migrant problem? How can we solve this inflation problem? Because people out here, they out here starving, man. What are we going to do about yeah, homeless? Paying $7 for wanna, milk. I, I don't, and don't get me I, I started wanna, with gas prices. Yeah, I don't want to turn on TV and say, uh, they're, they're getting ready to sue Biden, uh, Hunter Biden. Man, I don't care. Uh, number one, I, I want to make sure I clarify this. Nobody want to talk about the sexual stuff that went on with Trump in the 80s and 90s. We're living in 2024. Like, yo, man, can we get these gas prices down? Can we help Hawaii? Can we stop this migrant stuff? Can we stop this crime? That's what everyday people really concern themselves with. Ain't nobody sitting around saying, yo, man, what do you think they're going to do to Hunter Biden? We don't care. We, uh, wait, man, Trump. Rape that girl, number one. He has to pay that civil thing, whatever, what happened. But no, man, I, I'm a, I, listen, whatever happened, happened. That's none of my business. How can we solve some right. of the problems we got going on right now? And these politicians are playing games with us, man. I watched it earlier today. They're like, Pons. they got proof that some of the stuff they came up with on Biden was not true. And they're like, we don't care. We're going to try to impeach him anyway. I'm like, see, this is the problem with the system. Mm -hmm. System is garbage. Let me transition and get back into both of our wheels house, which is the world of sports, because we talk so much politics and I really, really appreciate it. But before I get to sports, I'll ask you this one last question about King Charles. If that show were to accomplish one thing above all else with you and Gail King on CNN, what would you want it to be? Well, I want us to venture away from the CNN narrative. I think CNN. Which is? I think CNN made a has made a big mistake. To be honest with you, they spend much, way too much time going after Trump. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't matter what you say about Trump; those people love that dude. They don't. And they're gonna vote. They're gonna vote for him. I think that's one of the reasons we've been going down a rabbit hole for the last few years. Um, come on, man! And that's the one thing I said. I said, oh, man. I'm not going to get on TV and blast Trump every day because that's why we're in the last fucking place because they don't care. They don't care. That's nothing that dude can do. Like, I, I use this analogy. Can you imagine if all this shit came out about President Obama? Oh, my God. Oh my, they would have burned down. They, they might have put him out. They might have pulled him out of the White House and cut. I know. They would have burned down the White House. And, like, the dude, he's, he, he, he apparently raped this woman. She won eighty some million. Then last week he gets a, like a three or four hundred million dollars. Like man, three hundred and fifty five million civil suit judgment against. And him. then people get on TV. It's just and gave him more money it, 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 and bought a sneakers. Oh, come on, man. Oh, hey, don't get me started on that. The sneakers. Yeah, because let me tell you something. 
Can you imagine if President Obama put out sneakers, what they'd be saying? Come on, man. Oh, my Lord. That, hey, hey. I, was, I will say this. I, no, I was Those telling plain my homeboys white sneakers the other, didn't I was up. telling my homeboys the other night. I was like, yo, man. Can you imagine what they'd be calling President Obama if he came out with sneakers? Mm. <laughs> I'll tell you something right now. I'll say it. I'll say it right on these public airwaves. Keeping your show on the air. I hope it continues. I'm wishing you and Gail nothing but the greatest success. Can't wait till y'all invite me on as a guest, by the way. Because I know you said you wanted to do that. And she told me this weekend when she saw me in Indy, she wanted to do that as well. Of course. I will tell you this. I will tell you this. I think if CNN was smart, you keep your show. You go back and you get Chris Cuomo. You go back and you get him. Because you say you want to be a centrist. You don't want to be too far left. You don't want to be too far right. He's a centrist. And it's the best they've had. Their best ratings. If I were them, let bygones be bygones. Shove all of that aside and get Chris Cuomo back to, to CNN. Uh, hey, hey, listen, doing, hey, I'm a Cuomo guy. Uh, I consider us uh, friends. Yes. I like him. First of all, you know, it's so funny when you said it. First of all, everybody should be a centrist. I agree. Everybody should be a centrist. Now, but everybody's not. You can go either way on certain issues, but everybody should start in the middle. I I, mm. well, I hate when people say to me, well, I'm a Republican, I'm a Democrat. I'm like, mm -hmm. well, you don't even know where they stand on some things. Like, right. come on, you, you, you can't say I'm a, what does that mean, I'm a, I'm a Republican? What does that mean, I'm a Democrat? You're supposed to vote for the person you think going to do the best job. Not, well, I'm always going to vote Republican. I'm always going to vote Democratic. I think that's the stupidest thing ever. It's a two-party system that fuels their coffers. That's all it does. And I'll tell you something else I'll say here, Charles. Are you ready for this? That whole Andrew Cuomo thing, that basically was, was just to get him out of office. We barely heard anything about it since he's been removed from the governor's seat in New York State. I wouldn't be, it wouldn't bother me if Andrew Cuomo was back in the mix. Politically speaking. Yeah, you know, like I say, hey, listen, I, we have to be really careful in that scenario, Stephen A., because right. as a man, you got a daughter, I got a daughter. Sexual harassment, yes, sexual harassment is, a, I got two daughters. Yeah, is a real, real thing. Oh, yeah. To convict him and throw him under the jail yeah. if he's guilty. Yeah. But when it disappears and then there's nothing to cling to him and all of a sudden it, you, you're saying the charges have been dropped and what have you. Well, wait a minute. That's right after he gets out of office. So it seemed like it was an effort to get him. I'm not saying he's innocent or guilty. I don't know. If he's guilty, he deserves what he gets. But if he's not guilty and it was just something to get him the hell up out of office. Yeah. Like I say, hey, hey, I, I don't know enough. Like I say, because I'm, I'm watching from a distance. Because like I say, as a man who has a daughter, man, I'm, I'm always going to protect women. Because the one thing, so am I. Hey, we got to be careful with women because, man, it's some, it's, some, it's some dogs out there. There's some no good bastard ass men out yes. there. Yes. No question about yes. it. No question. Let me transition back to sports before I let you get on out of here. The second half of the season, post All Star break is here. We're looking at the Eastern Conference. We're looking at the Western Conference. I think it's Boston's. I think the team that has the best shot to to give them a challenge right now is the New York Knicks. Unless Milwaukee gets their act together defensively, what are you seeing in the Eastern Conference? Well, I picked the Celtics at the start of the season, and I know you did too. So did I. Um, I need Jason Tatum to put his stamp on the season and the championship. He has to take over and be that leader because every team needs a leader. You know, he's, he's a great player, but you got to put your imprint on that team. I thought them getting Porzingis was icing on the cake. And I don't see anybody beating the Celtics. I just see, I just love to see Jason take more. Like you know, I love, I love the interview. He said, "I'm the best player in the NBA." Now go out and I think he's the only MVP. Yeah, but I, I, he's got my vote right yeah, now. Yeah, he's he's he, he's in there. But I'm saying he came out this weekend and said, "I think I'm the best player in the NBA." I yeah. love that. Now go prove it. Go mm. prove it. Uh, you know, the Philadelphia thing is interesting. Obviously, it's all about Joel's health. Cleveland, to me, Donovan's played great, but it's all about Jared Allen. Because Jared Allen and Mobley got manhandled by the Knicks in the playoffs. Yes, they did. And then that was easy. The Knicks are the wild card. I want to see the Knicks get healthy. Shout out to my boy Wes and, Le yep. and Leon Rose. The, the yep. Knicks are they relevant. Deserve it. The Knicks went for it. I give them credit. 
but they got to get healthy. And uh, Jalen Bronson, man, I'm so proud of that kid. He's an MVP candidate, Charles. No question. He's an MVP candidate. No question. Um, he is. But the Celtics are the team to beat in the East. I'm looking at the New York Knicks, and I'm saying to myself, I'm happy they're injured because if they weren't, Tom Thibodeau would have ran them into the ground. They would have been exhausted come playoff time. So I'm very, very happy at what I'm seeing right now. Out West, Denver's the reigning defending NBA champions. We cannot dismiss them. I think the biggest threat to them is not the Minnesota Timberwolves led by Anthony Edwards. It's not the Oklahoma City Thunder who's talented led by Shea Gilgis Alexander because I think they're too young, even though they're very talented. It's not the Lakers who were in the Western Conference Finals with them last year because I don't think the Lakers shoot the ball well enough. I think it's the Los Angeles Clippers. About, the Los Angeles it's Clippers. It's about time y'all got on the bandwagon. I, Shaq, been, the, your thought. Shaq been killing me for the last three months. I told him the, the Clippers are the best team in the West. And I, and it's Clippers, Nuggets. Can anybody get to their level? I got the, the the Clippers being the best team. Jamal Murray's got to pick it up to go with the Joker, the wild card, mm. the wild card, the Dallas Mavericks. Oh, stop it! Hey, stop! Why? Why? Well, first of all, they already got those two guys. I thought, other than your Knicks. I thought they had the second best trade deadline, Stephen A. I'm telling you, I love what they did at the trade deadline. That's getting Gafford to me is huge. Because mm. they were too small. They needed a bigger body because you got to, they needed somebody to go against the Joker. They needed somebody to go against Zubaz, because you got to keep that boy off the board. He's going to get a hundred offensive rebounds if you don't keep him off the boards. So they needed a big body. I love what they did. Uh, I can't trust anybody else in the West other than the Mavs to get, I really don't. My sons, you know, it's so interesting. Like I really want to root for the sons. And I said something the other day about KD and people, every time I say something, they take it and run with it. Of course. KD has said he doesn't want to be a leader. He's a great player, but he said he doesn't want to be a leader. Okay. <coughs> that's it. That's, and I said, Hey, that's fine. And the question was, how can my son take the next level? I says, well, Kevin has said he doesn't want to be a leader. I says, got to be Devin Booker, got to step up and say, boys, let's go. On every team, every team. That thing I just said about Jason Tatum. On every team, somebody got to step up and say, your boys, follow me. Kevin Durant, great player. Never going to say anything bad about it. He says, I don't want to be a leader. That's fine. I said, the question was asked to me. How can my sons become relevant? I said, Devin Booker's got to step up and be the leader and show the, show those boys, we're going this way. Y'all follow me. And so Phoenix, to me, is a wild card. But let me tell you something, man. Dallas, man, I, I really like what they did at the trade deadline. So who's your sleeper in the East, then, if Dallas is your sleeper in the West? Orlando? Hell. Indiana? Indiana. That's a good call. They got to get healthy, though. They got to get healthy because, let's be honest, nobody scares you in the East ex mm -hmm. except the Celtics. Nobody scares you in the East That's except true. the Celtics. You're like, yeah. Well, the Knicks will scare some people defensively. Yeah, but let me tell you something. With OG Ananobi there, if Mitchell Robinson comes back, yeah, but with Julius Randle and, and, and the crew, I, 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 I said mind. they got a shot at it, but you asked me a sleeper, I would say the Pacers. Because the Pacers going out and getting Siakam, because let me tell you something, Hallibur Halliburton has that thing. He thinks he's great. Yeah. He thinks, like you talked about Anthony Edwards, that boy thinks yeah. he's great. Yeah. No great player can be great unless he says, damn, I'm great. I'm betting most of these yeah. guys. I might be betting all those guys. Halliburton yeah. thinks that. Anthony Edwards thinks that. Jason Tatum said it. Now go out and prove it. That's because, like I say, you got to, to be a great player. You got to think you're great. You can't just say it. You got to go out mm -hmm. and you got to lead the rest of that team by example. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be a fun second half of the season. I'm looking forward to it. Right. Last question, last question, last nugget, and then the last question before I let you get on out of here. In terms of our earlier conversation, when you brought up what the all stars are getting paid, the lowest paid all star was Anthony Edwards at $13.5 and Tyrese Halliburton 
at five point eight million. Wow! And both of them, and both of them got two hundred million dollar extensions coming down the pipe. Well, let me tell you something. That, Already that boy to. Anthony Edwards. Special. What they called him? The, the the three? What they called him? Minnesota? The, I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't know what it is. It ain't the big three. No, no. It ain't the big three. Like, even though his cat, what his cat call Anthony Towns? No, 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 no. I'm Anthony talking Edwards. about the, the cities. Oh yeah, yeah. Twin. Well, true. The Twin Cities and is that is it's it? the what, Twin what Cities. The rivers there? It was Twin Cities. Okay. Well, uh, but the rivers, the three rivers, that, or something. No, that's and the three lakes. The three lakes in Minnesota. The three lakes. They're gonna have to get that boy all three lakes and the Twin Cities when it and it's by the time his career is over, because Anthony Edwards is a flat out monster. They're gonna have to give him Minneapolis, St. Paul. <laughs> They're gonna have to give him all those cities by the time right. he do his next contract. Cause he's a great player and he he's ascending, man. So he's unbelievable. Last qu- last question to you. I told your boy Kenny the other day, if you're not going to do away with NBA uh, with the slam dunk contest, since the stars don't want to contribute, first of all, I blame LeBron James for it. That's the only thing I blame LeBron James for. He, he's, a, he's the one superstar above the rim athletic player that never participated in the slam dunk contest that I can think of in the modern era. And everybody followed suit from there on. Okay. I'm not talking about the Zach Levines and the Aaron Gordons. Obviously, they put on a show years ago. But for the most part, the superstars ever wanted to participate. And I said, you know something? Throughout the streets of America, if we don't see nothing else, we see spectacular dunkers. How about having a nationwide contest? Bring the top seven to ten dunkers across the country after a nationwide contest to All-Star Weekend. Let an NBA superstar sponsor them and say, this is the guy I would think is going to win. This is the guy that I think is going to win. This is the guy that I think is going to win. Million-dollar prize for the winner, half a million dollars for the runner-up, $100 million prize for third-place finisher. That's what I think should happen because I think we'll see a spectacular dunk contest. What are your thoughts Well, two things. I suggested this. Ten years ago, nobody listened to me. For the All-Star game, I would do the United States against the world. I agree with that. I think we should do the United States against the world. And let me tell you something. I might take the world. Yep. I might take the world. Embiid, Jokic, Luka, alone. Wimby. Wimby Yana, yes. <laughs> yes. Hey. I mean, them alone? Yeah, hey. I, Absolutely. Yeah, uh, I'm going to count Canada as part of the world, too. That's right. Yeah, so... I think the United States against the world would be amazing. As far as the slam dunk, I think we probably, guys are afraid to lose. I think it's your point. Take guys off the street who can dunk. I think that might be good. The NBA players are worried about, first of all, I'm going to tell you something. I thought the fix was in this weekend. I thought the fix was in. For who? For, I, I thought they were trying to make sure Mac McClung didn't win. Didn't win. Yeah, I thought, didn't win because his scores were too low, and the mother's scores were too high. He 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 was better. He was, be- he was better hey, than the he other. He deserved to win it. After the he deserved. But it. after the first couple of rounds, I thought they're like, whoa, and everybody was complaining about the judge. And I says, the only thing I can think of, they don't want this kid who's not in the NBA to win again. That's all I could think a of. A G League. That's all I could think. A G League. Uh, yes, I was like, yo, man, his numbers were low, and those other numbers are a little too high. And I think people started complaining. They're like, yeah, but do that boy fairly because he deserved to win. But I thought, I ain't going to lie, Stephen A., I thought the fix was in for a minute. Charles Barkley, I appreciate you, my man. I can't wait to watch you. And Gail, CNN, King Charles, I'm not going to miss it. You talking to Nikki Haley, I appreciate your time, man. Thank you so much. And, you know, I'll be watching you throughout the rest of the season before we meet up in the playoffs, big bro. Right. Good talk. All right, to my you. brother, you be safe and take care of yourself. And by the way, y'all got me good when I showed up on your show when we were doing that in-season tournament. First of all, it was hilarious. Oh, That's yeah. number one. Oh, the no, best but time I, I but had no, all year. But I, you know what? When I sent you the text, are you all right? Are you able to do the show? You you got a brace on your ankle and everything? <laughs> man, I bust my hey, ass. I, I was on the court, man, and I slipped on a hey, wet spot. Bust my hey, ass. Hey, I, I know how to, hey, I know how to do mouth to mouth. mouth. My ankle smelled up. It's my ankle. If you need mouth to mouth, I know how to do that, man. I <laughs> Listen, man, that's damn near as funny as Shaq and the Fool doing Shaq and the Fool doing it. It was hilarious as hell, man. I really loved it. (laughs) All right, boy. Be safe. Love you, bro. All right, man. Take it easy. Everyone knows I demand excellence, and I'm in it to win it. So that's why I've teamed up with Prize Picks, America's number one fantasy sports app, to help turn my sports knowledge into some big-time money. 
Prize Picks is a daily fantasy app where you simply choose two or more of your favorite players, pick more or less on their projected stats, and then submit your entry in less time than it'll take Steph Curry to dribble up the court and hit a long-range game-winning three. So every basket, rebound, and assist gets bigger each week. Download the Prize Pick app today and join a community of more than 3 million members. And if you do, Prize Picks will match your first time deposit of up to $100. Yeah, that's right. You heard me. Go to prizepicks.com right now and use code SAS. My initials, of course, in case you didn't figure that out. Just use promo code SAS on Prize Picks to receive a first deposit match of up to $100 and then let the games begin. Prize Picks, pick more, pick less. It's that easy. Wow, that was some great, great, great conversation between myself and Charles Bark. I really thoroughly enjoyed it, just hearing his positions on a lot of different things. I mean, what didn't we talk about? We talked about the economy. We talked about the Democratic and the Republican Party. We talked about conservatism versus liberalism. We talked about how we felt about politicians, not any, not specific politicians, but overall in general, and how the black community, both of us feeling like we've been taken for granted to some degree, not letting anybody off the hook, just acknowledging what is and what can be. Neither of us want to vote for or endorse Donald Trump. We certainly are not high on the aging before our eyes, President Joe Biden. Uh, neither of us mentioned Vice President Kamala Harris because, quite frankly, not enough has been done in terms of her ability to resonate to warrant mentioning her. That's a fact. That's something that we can tackle at a later date, but the reality is whether it's because of the White House administration itself and how they pigeonholed and marginalized her, whether it's her allowing herself to come across as that ineffectual, the reality is, is that if you asked most of the populace in the United States of America right now who should be the candidate for the presidency of the United States representing the Democratic Party if indeed Joe, Joe Biden were to step aside the name that comes to your mind is not Kamala Harris. It's Gavin Newsom. And you never heard me mention Michelle Obama. And you heard Charles Barkley's reaction to that. So there's a lot of stuff going on. There's no question about it. Neither of us are aficionados, but we pay attention to current events and current affairs and the kind of things that are going on. We understand that these are incredibly troubling times and we need to get this nation back in order in some capacity. Who that right candidate is or should be remains to be seen. Charles Barkley seems to be sold on somebody like a Nikki Haley, potentially. Me, not so much. Uh, but in the event, in any event, rather, he said what he had to say. I said what I had to say. I hope you all have enjoyed the conversation. I hope people take it to light and, and feel free to respond to such things. And we'll see what transpires in the days and the weeks and the months to come. Because the election is coming on fast. Okay. It's literally 10 months away. Think about that for a second. In 10 months, we'll know what direction this nation is going in. And we'll know indeed how much we truly, truly have to fear. And that's saying a lot because most of us are scared as hell now. Just think about that. Thanks again to the one and only Charles Barkley. This is Stephen A. Signing off. Hope you all have an absolutely positively wonderful weekend. Look forward to talking to y'all first thing next week. Until then. Peace and love.